The following program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Time of Grace. Welcome to Time of Grace. I'm Pastor Mike Novotny. In my office, way up on the left bookshelf, is a DVD called The Forgotten God. You might think it's about our culture, which so quickly forgets about God's role and work in their life. You might think it's about people abandoning God altogether and embracing agnostic or atheist beliefs, but it's not. It's about the God that we forget. It's about the Holy Spirit. It's so easy to think about the Father, isn't it? Our Father who art in heaven. So easy to think about God the Son who died on the cross for our sins, but just as important in our lives is the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Today, Pastor Mark Jeske is going to remind us that the Holy Spirit is just as important as the Father and the Son in our spiritual lives. You'd think that the inventors of powered flight would have been lionized right in 1903 in Kitty Hawk and they were pretty much ignored and what they were doing was underappreciated and all I can say is man the Holy Spirit knows your pain Uh, those two guys pain because man nobody pays any attention to the Holy Spirit or hardly anybody does he's hard the Spirit is hard to imagine all you got to work with is a rushing mighty wind like a cyclone that does not destroy little tongues of flame And God often appeared as fire in the Old Testament. I think he loves that image of fire that can destroy, but a fire that can also bring light and warmth to a home. And a dove. It's hard hard to like really respect a little bird, isn't it? I mean, and of all not even an eagle, a dove, a pigeon. The lowliest of birds, right? That's that's our mental images. What how else can you even grasp the significance of the Spirit. And the the Spirit's okay with that. He could have found other dramatic ways to reveal himself to the world, but he's not so interested in attention as results. He is fine with leading people's attention to be focused on Christ, the Word of God made flesh, our personal substitute. After all, it was only Christ, not the Father or the Spirit, who died for us. Having said all that, however, the Spirit of the Lord is the reason why you are on a track that is leading you straight up to heaven instead of a slippery slide that is going to whisk you right down to hell the minute you die. The Spirit is the reason you can live with joy and a sense of freedom. You can live knowing that I am somebody. You can live knowing how, who is God and how do I connect? You don't have to make up your own gig with God, wondering, am I getting this right? You don't have to, it's not a blind roll of the dice. You don't have to look over a whole sea of equally distasteful choices and say, well, I'm going to try this or I'm going to try this. Like, you know, people's different, uh, they're different good luck strategies for winning the lottery, right? Everybody's got, you know, all the lottery players all have little rituals they go through. It. Like, well, I always buy one ending in an even number, or I only buy my tickets on a Friday, that's my lucky day. Or this guy's thing is, I never buy them myself. See, I have my daughter buy them, that's, she's my good luck. Every one of those strategies somebody may brag about, but they're all just shots in the dark, right? And, they, and you kind of know inside, they're not going anywhere. None of those have any cause and effect. None of those have any meaning whatsoever. The Spirit of the Lord enables you to connect with certainty to your God. Know who you are, what you're doing here, why you exist. Lay out a mission for you connected with the gifts the Spirit has put within you and gives you the confidence to know you're immortal so that you are freed from the terrible pressure that you've got to get it all now. And when you know you're going to live for eternity, you don't have to get it all now. It takes away from you the pressure to cheat and lie and steal to get more now. Because whatever you wish you had had now and may lack, you can just say, well, I'm living forever. Whatever, I got plenty of time. I don't have to cheat or live like a pig in order to find fulfillment now because I know I got all the time in the world. 
so I can just enjoy my life now. Man, doesn't that take, like, can't you just feel the weight lifting off you? You can enjoy who you are and where you are. And the Spirit of the Lord gives you that, makes you alive. I'd like to invite you to take your Bible or a smart device if you are electronically oriented that way. And I'd like to invite you to go with me to Psalm 104. An absolutely spectacular psalm. I hope you get to know and love this psalm. It's a poetic celebration of what God has done to bring about the universe. And not everybody knew these things because the knowledge of creation perished in the ancient world. People began to ascribe the universe to other gods and goddesses. They made up mythologies to explain the unexplainable. Today it's lost too in huge sectors of our society today. Even to suggest the idea of ID gets hooted at with derision. What's ID? Intelligent design. Intelligent design. You don't even have to use the G word, God. If you just say intelligent design in some circles, you'll get laughed out of the room from people who are committed to the idea that the world made itself by blind chance and billions of years of nature with a capital N, Mother Nature, making experiments of which only the most successful survived. That is the theory that probably the majority of your fellow countrywomen and countrymen believe in. That is their explanation of why they exist, which is that there's no meaning at all. For we are not designed, they would say. There is no intelligent design. There's only, uh, as uh, was a Tennyson who said, nature red in tooth and claw. And we just happen to be the latest iteration of evolution. Psalm 104 and its anonymous author beg to differ and poetically take you through the marvel and mystery of what God did in the first six days of creation. Some people may say that, uh, well, you know, I don't believe in, in creation. I'm an evolutionist. And, and I don't think it's any big loss if you just shave the first 11 chapters off the book of Genesis. We're still, I still believe in Jesus. And I, got, I believe everything really important. I just don't want to fight with evolutionists over something I believe just might be a myth anyway. However, if you mess with Genesis, you have just now messed with the Psalms. Because the very same things that Genesis lays out for us as orderly historical facts, Psalm 104 now poetically bases everything it has to say on those first couple of chapters of Genesis. Want to know what I mean by that? Good, I'm glad you asked. Let's dig in. Psalm, Psalm 104, perfect lead-up question. I'm setting me up for my next point. Psalm 104, we're going to go flying through this and then land at the, uh, let's see, third last paragraph. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Why? O Lord, my God, you are very great, clothed with splendor and majesty. Day one of creation, wraps himself in light as with a garment. You know, on day one when God created light, let there be light, his first utterance in the history of the universe, there was no sunlight because there was no sun. There wasn't going to be any sun till day four. There was no starlight or moonlight for there were no heavenly bodies. The only possible source of that light was God himself. So on day one, God entered the human world. He entered the giant mess and mud ball and the radiance from his glory and presence illuminated everything. Day two, he invented the sky. He stretches out the heavens like a tent, it says in verse 2. Inventing the atmosphere so that his creatures would have something to breathe. He put some water up in the air and some on the surface of the earth and some in the deeps underneath the surface. So he split the water uh, so that uh, this is like pre... He's creating the conditions for rainfall in the convection cycle. Verse 5, uh, God rearranged the mud so that some would be water, bodies of water, rivers and lakes and oceans, and some of it would be dry land, the continents. He set the earth on its foundations. And you covered it with the deep as with a garment. If you jump ahead to verse 19, day four is when God made the heavenly bodies. The moon 
marks off the seasons, and the sun knows when to go down. It's kind of cute that the sun is smart enough to know when to go down. Actually, the sun's just laying there burning, and the earth is going around it, but this is much more poetic. Verse 24 has days 5 and 6. On day 5, God made the creatures up in the air. The birds were made in great profusion, and also he made the stuff below the waters. All the fish and sea creatures came into being on day 5. On day 6, the land critters, including you and me. Day 6, we come in. How many are your works, O Lord? Verse 24, in wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures including the sea. Verse 26, the second half talks about the Leviathan. Those are the great fishes like the great sharks and the huge whales and other critters. You formed to frolic there. Isn't that a cool line? If I can just, you got a minute? Can I, can I just pause with you and just go wow at that first? He made the big fish to have a little fun. Does that not strike you as being really cool? He didn't make them just to be props. He made fish to have some fun too. Because he exults in their swimming and leaping in how they form their families and their activities. The animals of the sea frolic too. Get Kelly, another little story I heard this past week. There was a Swiss marine biologist who was, must have been a bit of a metal worker and physicist too because he, he was one of the developers of the bathysphere, one of those super heavy walled iron things, contraptions you can lower down. And he also was a pioneer in deep sea photography. So he figured out lighting rigs that wouldn't get shorted out or burst under the pressure, and he would go down miles below the surface of the water. So deep that no light could penetrate. There are places at the ocean bottom that never see light. They are always in pitch darkness. And what he found down there was so extraordinary. He found brilliantly colored sea creatures who could function and live with that insanely heavy pressure of miles of water weighing down on them. Not only were they brilliant examples of engineering, but they were colored. Why would God paint a beautiful palette of colors on animals that no person or fish could see? He could see them. He was having fun with their beautiful colors. God lavishes design and energy on stuff nobody will ever see. Why? Because he can. Because he loves beauty. Because he loves to explode in super abundance and go crazy with his unlimitedness. There are so many stars in the sky, you can't even begin to approximate how many there might be. 50 billion times 50 billion does not even cover it all. They just keep going on and on. And and our best and brightest wizards of physics say the universe is still expanding. God may not even be done with creation yet. There might be more universe still happening on the far fringes, you know, hundreds of billions of light years away that no human being will probably ever see. He's still making stars, gigantic fireballs, consuming huge amounts of energy. Where did all that energy come from? From the unlimited energy of our God who loves to go crazy and do things on a scale that make us feel like the tiniest of atoms. Just because he loves doing things that big and that wonderful. This psalm celebrates that. And among the living creatures is us. All of us, now verse 27, now savor these with me. All of us on the surface of this earth all look to you. We and the critters all depend on the food chain, on a sustainable food chain that there will continue, animals will continue to be born, plants will continue to grow, the rain will continue to fall, the sun will continue to shine. This fertility cycle that God set in motion is life and death for us, and not a one of us can control it or invent it. We just enjoy it. We're plunked down here and just say, oh, we all look to you, Lord. 
you to give us our food at the proper time. And when you give it to them, we gather it up. And when you open your hand, we are satisfied with good things. We're just like little birds in a nest. When Mama Eagle comes by, we're all going, feed me. Isn't that sweet? What a sweet feeling. That does, that, that doesn't, I don't mean you any disrespect. You have to work for your food. But man, God is this, the design and the energy and the fertility keeping everything going in such a fabulous way. That's why we love to pray when we eat. It's just a little reminder. Lord, you're, we're looking to you, and man, you do it. You did it again. You are also still the Lord and judge of this planet. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. The Lord is a life giver, but he's also a life taker as well. Every creature on this earth owes its existence to God, and every human creature owes his or her existence to God as well. He is our maker, and we're accountable to him. He is also a slayer of the wicked, and we stand before him in awe and respect. For he is not just your big buddy in the sky. He's not just a semi-senile old grandpa up there who basically can't control his naughty boys and girls on earth anymore. He is a God who has given his law, a God who sees, a God who remembers, and a God who cares. He is a God who takes away breath as well as gives it. They die and go back to the dust. Death is not... Uh, I know you've maybe seen the video or maybe you've gone to the musical of The Lion King and there's these sweet songs in The Lion King about the circle of life. You know how, how beautiful it is. It's just this elegant, beautiful, sweet thing and how death just means that there's going to be more grass, like your body will turn into more grass for the next gen of the lion pride to munch on and, and, and other animals can feed off of you and you're just part of this sweet beauty. That's a sweet bunch of bogus. The reality is death is an intruder that we invited, and it's a punishment. Death is a punishment for human rebellion. And I, I'm not trying to creep you out for every funeral you go to. The fact is, though, you, you aren't telling yourself the truth if you don't recognize why people die. It's not that cures for their diseases haven't been found yet. People die because God is angry. We need to respect the fact that the Creator is a taker of breath and humble ourselves and ask for His mercy. For because we are the children of Adam and Eve, we are the children of their rebellion. And every time you sin, every mean, ugly thing you've thought or said ties you into their rebellion and ties you in to the curse of death that's coming after you as well. And you're all being stalked by something far creepier than a rapist. You are being stalked by death itself, and he will show up possibly when you do not expect it. But, the story doesn't stop here. When you send your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the earth. This is a little nugget placed here for God's Old Testament believers to realize that the spirit, the life giver, does not give up with the presence of death on earth but is a renewer and a giver back of life. And in the New Testament, you know, I, I, I told you in the Bible study two weeks ago that God's revelation is progressive, meaning Adam and Eve did not know as much as you know. And Abraham and David, though they were giants of faith, Sarah and Rebecca, tremendous big women of faith who did incredible things, struggled and labored with far less information than you have. Any one of you, even the children in our Christian school, know more about God's plan of salvation than they did because God's revelation proceeds and he keeps adding more chapters all the time. Not to change the game, but to add detail. And we all enjoy a vastly greater level of detail. That little phrase about the Spirit's life-giving activity was unpacked later on. If, I can, if you can permit, uh, jump ahead just as one example to St. Paul's letter to Titus. Here's how the Spirit does that in your life and my life today. St. Paul told um, 
Titus to pass on to his congregation. At one time, even we, we believers, we Christians, and he used four painfully embarrassing words about what we are like in God's eyes by birth. Foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved. Isn't that embarrassed? Hey, slaves. Hey, sinful rebels. Hey, fools. Ooh. Kind of, kind of uncomfortable talk, isn't it? That's what, but that's what we are. Let's just be real. We're all like, you know, this is like a big AA meeting. We're like sin, sinaholics anonymous. We all got to go to our meeting and confess with one another. We have sin. This is us. All of us have done and thought things that were foolish. We have disobeyed what we know to be God's truth. Deceived. We we are. We both lie and to others and lie to ourselves and get lied to, enslaved. We're locked into a doom that we are powerless to get out of. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. That's all that's left. If you don't like yourself and you know you're dying, all that's left is to resent people who have more than you. Malice means you enjoy other people's suffering and envy means you want somebody else's life. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is how the Spirit of the Lord makes you alive. He connects you to Christ, whose perfect life becomes your substitute, whose innocent death stands in for your death, who absorbed in His body all of that wrath of God, and who has transformed your day of dying from a day of fear and dread that's all over now, and now I lose everything and has transformed your dying day to the day when you finally hit the biggest lottery in the world. It's the day, not when everything's taken from you. It is the first day of your new real life when everything is given to you. It's the day in which you get your inheritance, one worth waiting for. And the Spirit is who does that for you. Quietly realizing, because He's so invisible and so quiet, A lot of people won't notice his work or think it was their idea or they will forget to say thank you. But the Spirit working through the Word and the Word, when the Word is connected to water through baptism, same power, same dynamics, you are connected to Christ. The Spirit connects us to Christ, the Savior, which gives you a life that is enjoyable and worth living, takes the fear and guilt and pressure off of you and connects you to hope of immortality where Satan will never trouble you again, where you will never sin again, and where you will never be sick or die again. No more separation, no more tears, no more pain. This is the life that the Holy Spirit gives you, and it's something to celebrate. Even as our little Pentecost season now comes to its little end, I hope that you appreciate the fact that what keeps you connected in faith and the gathering of believers that the Spirit connects, this is His electricity, His power, to give you the ability, first of all, to hear that message in a language you can understand, and then believe it, so that you are connected to Christ now and forever. This is good news for God's people. And if you believe what I just said, then say, Amen. My favorite word in the entire English language might be the word, this. I should explain. In my family, this is a one-word way to remind ourselves, God made this. This is just a little taste or a glimpse of the glory of God. That's essentially what the Holy Spirit does. He opens our eyes to see that this beautiful water, the peaceful moment at the cabin up north, the laughter of children, the excitement of the big city, all these things that we love that thrill us and excite us and make us reach for our cameras to try to capture the moment. This is just a taste of the glory of God. 
We love the work that the Holy Spirit does, not just pointing us to Jesus to see his power and his grace, but opening our eyes to see the glory and the beauty of God all around us each and every day. I'll be back to pray with you in just a moment. Scripture is clear that the Holy Spirit is completely equal with God the Father and God the Son, but all too often you and I as Christians fail to give him an equal place in our lives. We want to help you make the Holy Spirit a daily part of your life and start experiencing more of his awesome, life-giving power. That's why we want to send you a book that I wrote called The Neglected Spirit, Understanding and Adoring the Holy Spirit. In it, I show you how the Spirit empowers you to overcome life's challenges, lead others to Christ, and experience victory in your spiritual life. The Neglected Spirit is our thank you for your donation to share the timeless truths of God's Word with more people. Call 800-661-3311, text TIME to 313131, or visit timeofgrace.org forward slash store. Did you know that the Holy Spirit is using you to open people's eyes to the glory of God? He is using your support and your gifts and your prayers to help this ministry that proclaims how beautiful and glorious our Heavenly Father is week after week and year after year. So from us here at Time of Grace, thank you so much for your support. Would you join me then in a prayer? Dear Holy Spirit, you had recorded that the whole earth is full of the glory of God. And we are so thankful that you made a glorious world. You were hovering over the waters at creation and what you brought into existence captivates us so many days of our lives. We thank you, God, for cool water and warm sunshine. We thank you for the pets that bring joy and companionship into our lives. We thank you for children and grandchildren. We thank you for bodies that work. We thank you for technology. We thank you for our minds and our brains. We thank you for doctors and nurses. God, you are active in all of it. So help us to see you. We want to know you better than we did before. We want you to see you in more places than we ever have before. So open our eyes to glimpse the glory and the beauty of God. Holy Spirit, thank you for loving us. Thank you that despite all of our sins that you have not given up on us. So often we have resisted you and yet you have persistently dwelled in our hearts. Help us to invite you in even more. That we would love the fact that you dwell with us and that we never walk alone. And so we pray all these things, Holy Spirit, by your powerful work, that we would come to follow you more closely and our lives would gush with your divine love. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, to whom you direct our eyes. Amen. With time of grace, I'm Pastor Mike Novotny, and it all starts now. It all starts now. Mm, it all starts now. The preceding program was brought to you by the friends and partners of Time of Grace.